All these PCBs here are from compact fluorescent lamps, or better known as CFLs. In this video we will understand the working principle of these light bulbs, the parts that it has, the physics inside of the tube and how the electronic ballast works. In this way we could understand why these light bulbs are so popular nowadays. Why they are a lot more efficient and very easy to control. We will also see some disadvantages. I will show you step by step each component on the PCB, tell you what each will do and using animations I will try my best to make you understand the working principle of this circuit. So make sure that you subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if you consider supporting my work check my Patreon page. So let's get started. This video is sponsored by GLC PCB a PCB manufacturer company with low prices of only $2 for 5 PCBs and more. GLCPCB.com invites you to take part of the online electronics exhibition for virtual communication with all GLCPCB users and the 100% chances of winning gifts such as smartphones, 3D printers, cameras, gift cards and coupons. Anyone attending the show could win up to 4 prizes, so register before the exhibition starts for more chances. More information in the video description. GLCPCB wishes you good luck. What's up my friends, welcome back. So here I have a CFL light bulb. CFLs are just the compact version of common fluorescent neon tube with a compact electronic ballast in the base of the lamp that is smaller and easier to install. This bulb is made out of two parts. The fluorescent tube which could be curved, spiral or straight and the electronic ballast. The first fluorescent lights weren't using electronic ballast but a combination of a choke coil and a so-called starter. We will see these components and how they work later in the video. If we look at the base of the tube, we can see that it has 4 wires coming out. Inside of the tube these are connected to some electrodes, one on each end. These electrodes are usually treated with barium. So interesting fact, that's why you will always see the electrodes wires winded around a metal connector instead of being soldered to the PCB. Since the electrode wire is treated with barium and the output wire is made out of other materials, it can be soldered using normal solder, so it's easier to just wind it around a metal pin. The tungsten filaments are inside of the tube, which has vacuum so it's protected. So let's see what happens if you power on the filaments but without the vacuum protection. As you can see they burn out in a second. The CFL light bulbs consist of a switch mode converter or electronic ballast that functions on a very high frequency and acts as a replacement for the electrical choke and the starter assembly that we had a few years back. So first let's see a little bit of physics. The glass tube is filled with mercury and argon. When current flows, the electrons will strike the mercury and argon atoms inside of the tube and the energy is transferred to the mercury atom and that will push its electrons to a higher orbit. When these electrons will fall back to their orbit, they must release the extra energy they have just received. They release this energy in form of ultraviolet radiation. Now this type of radiation is not useful for us and is also dangerous because it could give us skin cancer. So that's why the tube is coated with phosphor, which is a fluorescent material. So this material receives the UV radiation and it will convert it into white visible light. So that's how the fluorescent tube works. But there are a lot of unanswered questions. How can we create the electron flow from one side to the other? Why we have two electrodes? Why we need the electronic ballast? How to connect it and how does it work? First let me explain the old circuit with the choke ballast and the starter component and then I will explain to you the new electronic ballast step by step. Ok so remember we have our tube filled with mercury and one electrode on each end. We connect our high frequency electricity on one input of each electrode. And the other two inputs are connected together with a so called starter. The starter component inside has two thin metal contacts that are normally open so they won't touch each other. 
it also has a capacitor inside like this. On one of the inputs we place the electrical choke, which usually is just a coil wanded on a ferrite core. When we first supply the circuit at let's say 220 volts, the circuit is still open, because the connectors inside of the starter are not touching each other. So as you can see at this moment, the electrons can flow from here to here, in order to make the mercury radiate UV. But inside of the starter we also have vacuum, and the metal contacts are close enough for the 220 volts to create an electrical plasma arc. This plasma arc will hit the connectors just enough to change their shape and connect them one to each other. So that will now close the circuit, and a lot of current will flow from one side to the other. That's how the tube will turn on. Actually, here I have a close-up and a slow motion of the starter metal connectors, creating the plasma arc. It's pretty cool to see, right? The arc is vibrating because we supplied this with AC of 50 Hz. So after some sparks, the metals will connect to each other and close the circuit for just a moment. At this point, two things will happen. This current flow will heat up the tungsten filaments, and that will start releasing electrons. But these electrons are still not creating a current path from one side to the other, because there is not enough force to push them. But this current flow will also energize the choke coil, by creating a powerful magnetic field around it. But you see, in just a few moments, the metal connectors inside of the starter are getting cold, and they will once again separate. So that will open the circuit, and the powerful magnetic field inside of the ballast will now collapse, and as you all know, that will create a huge voltage spike. Now the voltage differential between the ends of the tube is high enough for the current to arc inside of the tube, between the two electrodes. So now all the electrons are pushed from one side to the other. Once this current path is made, the 220 volts is enough to keep the current flow going on and on. We only need high voltage spikes at the beginning. Also once the current is flowing, the ballast acts as an impedance in series, so it will lower the voltage on the starter, so it won't flicker anymore. So that's why we need the starter and the ballast coil, and that's why at the beginning the old fluorescent tubes were blinking a few times, till the current path was created. So now the electrons could flow, they will hit the mercury vapor, create the UV radiation, which will then hit the phosphor coat on the tube and radiate visible light. The phase of the 220 volts AC is connected to the ballast in series, and then to the left side of the tube. The neutral is connected to the right side, and the same side is connected to the starter, which is connected in series with the left side. So now I power on the circuit. The starter flashes a few times, and then the tube glows, and it will stay that way. Ok, so now let's study the compact electronic ballast. The PCB of a CFL ballast circuit is a combination of four different circuits. The EMI filter circuit, the full bridge rectifier, the DC filter circuit and the inverter circuit. So instead of the ballast and the starter, how else we can get the high voltage? Well, we can use an electrical circuit that is made with transistors. As you can see on this PCB, we have the main input connected to four diodes, which is the full bridge rectifier. Then we have this big capacitor acting as a filter and creating a steady high DC voltage. From here we have the inverter, which is made with two transistors. The output of the transistor bridge is connected to a coil and another capacitor, which is called a resonant tank. As you can see this PCB has no driver IC. So what will enable and disable the gate of the transistors? Well, the coil and the capacitor will create an LC tank, which will resonate, and by that we can create both the positive and the negative polarity waves. This coupled inductor here, each time the oscillation polarity changes, since it's connected to a resistor and then to the gate of the transistor, it will turn on and off one and the other transistors. These components will work with DC voltage. So first from those 220 volts AC, we place the full bridge rectifier. But first we usually have a fuse for protection, and sometimes we have a resistor to limit the current. The rectifier will rectify the signal, 
as we have seen in the SMPS video, and only get the positive weights. We then add a capacitor which will filter the voltage and give us a steady high voltage DC. Now we add the two transistor bridge. At the output of the bridge, we have our coils. In order to create the high voltage AC, we first enable the bottom transistor for example. So now the current will flow through the electrode circuit from positive, through the electrodes, and then through the transistor, back to ground. But that will also store some energy in the coil as a magnetic field. But the coil has a capacitor on the side, so this will create an LC tank. The magnetic field from the coil will then collapse, and charge the capacitor, but with inverted polarity, and also higher voltage, because as you all know, the coil will create a high voltage spike. Since the coils are coupled together, this process will change the polarity on the gate of the transistors. So now the top transistor will be turned on and the bottom one will be turned off. That will create a current flow in the reverse direction. The magnetic field will now collapse, charge the capacitor once again and invert the polarity of the transistors, and this process will repeat on and on. That will create a high voltage high frequency signal. And this signal is used to power the fluorescent bulb and keep the current of the electrons flowing. So that's basically how the electronic ballast will create the high voltage of around 1000 volts and also the high frequency. The frequency created of the CFL ballast is usually from 20 kHz to 80 kHz because it's proven that at higher frequency the light emission is better. Once the CFL bulb glows, the voltage across will decrease to around 220 volts and the ballast circuit will allow the current flow through the tube. The good thing is that the filaments are in series, so if they get damaged, the oscillations inside of the circuit will automatically stop, so everything will be protected. So guys, that's how the fluorescent light tubes work. That's how they glow using some electrons and chemicals inside of the tube, and that's how the compact version works as well. If compared with an incandescent light, where a lot of power is lost in the form of heat, one of the biggest advantages of the CFL bulb is the low energy consumption, which also produces less heat, has a much higher lifetime compared with the incandescent light or halogen lamps and produces pleasant light. If you learned something new, give a like to this video. Also consider subscribing and activating the notification bell. Consider supporting me on Patreon. So thanks again and see you later guys. Hey guys, Electronoops here. Just wanted to thank you very much for supporting me on Patreon and uh, for subscribing to this channel because as you know I, bought a lot, I buy a lot of modules and batteries and Arduinos for all the projects and that requires money. So your help on Patreon will keep these kind of videos going so uh, I, will be, I will have more time to make more projects and more money to buy more components. So thank you very much, you have the links for my Patreon below if you want to support me and if you can't, well just subscribe to this channel and give a like to this video. Thank you very much guys.